And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me as always is my good brother here in the temple. <laughs> and the or I should say I should say returning good brother. I'm too I'm too used to Valley of the Judge. Sorry <laughs> about that. Um coming to us from the wonderful world of fum of of fum of of Fumble G D R. Yeah. <laughs> the, the creator of Knights of the Round and now re re releasing its Shonen expansion, the one and only Claudio Serena. Hi everyone, it's good to be back in the monastery. Thank, thank you for, thank you for coming back in, um, and braving the hell that is time zones. <laughs> yeah, I didn't it's, realize it's manageable on a Sunday. It's it's always manageable. So yeah, I usually I usually do and I usually. Whenever I have to deal with across the pond ones, I usually do them on weekends because it's easier for both for both sides. Because I don't do my day job on on the weekends, and if I if I were to do a eve a um evening for me, it'd be the dead of night for most folk. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, some people say that say that they're night owl say that they're night owls and they can handle that kind of late night. The question I always have to ask is, how late is late? For me, it would be 1 a.m. Uh, the limit. After that, uh, I would be mumbling and bumbling around uh, too much. Mm -hmm. And I, it's a it's a case where I don't where I don't like to gamble it. Of course, some t sometimes I have the opposite end of, end of the spectrum when I'm dealing with um, when I'm dealing with folks who are who are behind me or in some cases so far ahead that they're in the future. <laughs> like at any time I've got somebody who's on the other side of the international dateline. Yeah. Oh. But it's but it's been it's been quite a bit since I had you on for the interview proper and thanks for highlighting the review that I did on Kotra. Thank you for the review and uh, I hope you are still enjoying playing Kotra after I, all this meeting. I cer I certainly am. Uh, but we'd but it's been it's been about a year since I had since I had you on in the temple. Yeah, um, it was about November or, or October. October. October, yeah, yeah. So how how have you how have you been holding up in the in the meanwhile? I've been uh, crazy busy and uh, uh, Shonen took a lot of our time as well as the Kotra uh, Kickstarter fulfillment. Mm -hmm. um, US packages are on their way. They're taking uh, a lot of time because they're traveling by by sea and then there's the distribution on the U in the US. So it's going slower than than I wanted, and it took a lot of time out of our lives to to follow that. But um, I'm really happy how Shonen came up. Uh, we are writing uh, and finalizing the rules for uh, the Nightball, and uh, we are also almost there with the introductory uh, adventure for uh, Kotra. So everything is lining up, and this is giving me time to work on new projects as well. So. Um, I ended up I ended up name dropping you when I, in the in the last um, hangover stream that that I that I did a few month about a month ago because a um a interesting ge an interesting game ended up dropping called Galahad twenty ninety three, mm -hmm. which can best be described as a as a hero shooter with mechs except all the mechs have are named after Arthurian characters. <laughs> Yeah, that that reminds me of something. <laughs> Let's just say that. Uh, I have to correct myself. Um, Galahad thirty ninety three. Granted, the mechs in in that one are more akin to are more akin to battle tech style mechs, i.e., tanks with legs. Mm -hmm. But 
it but it's it is but I couldn't help but make but make the connection especially with the names. Yeah, there's a certain resemblance. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh. And and hey well it ha well it has a mixed response on on St on Steam. I ca I um well it's not like I, it's not like I ever picked games just because of how popular they were. <laughs> But with now with with shown with shonen, one of the key things with it within it that ha that obviously isn't going to fit is the for most cases is the mech aspects. Was that a difficult thing to to ad to adapt since not every shonen is going to have mecha? Uh, not really, because. Uh, uh... While I was uh, writing the new jobs, I also uh, wrote up some alternatives. So if you don't want to use your Mac and you want to just relay on Shonen uh, archetypes, you can just do that. So you you don't have to use uh, a knight if you are if you are an athlete or if you are uh, an idol. Uh, you can if you want to. The rules uh, work uh, both ways. But you have alternatives for each job uh, to to expand and explore uh, other things, other uh, um, stereotypes, let's say, of the shonen genre and shoujo, because mm -hmm. there are some things that come from there as well. The majoko job is clearly one of those. Mm -hmm. And we'll we will we will certainly get into that. Um, now. When I had when I had you on, I, I will admit I focused quite a bit on the on the mecha aspect, for obvious reasons. It's <laughs> the phrase "elephant in the room" is is used because elephants are big and hard to ignore. Yeah. But I didn't get it. But I didn't have the opportunity to talk on the show on the shonen aspect. Um. As. To, I would I would ask what I would ask what what your first shonen anime was, but a lot of people are going to give very very obvious responses on that. So instead, um, where were you first exposed to the to the concept of shonen as a as a name for a genre or or subgenre if you want to be pedantic? <laughs> uh, well, you should know that in Italy, um, Italy is the second most uh, um, consuming uh, nation in the world of anime. The first one is Japan, and right after Japan, there's Italy. So we have a lot of anime and mangas, and we had for decades. So um, we had many magazines uh, with uh, different uh, storylines, uh, and I was, I think, eight or ten when I first. Uh, uh, came to hear the word shonen for something. Um, I think it was in a Dragon Ball uh, manga uh, in the editorial section of the of the manga, and uh, it never left me. Uh, I, I stayed with it for thirty years now, so mm -hmm. I'm thirty eight. The math, it's that. Yeah. Because the reason why I phrased it like that is a lot of is in my experience a lot of people got exposed to anime before long before they got exposed to the idea of genres of anime. Yeah. Um, yeah, but but we had so many animes that we had to face it uh, sooner than later. And yeah. so you it, didn't have a cultural thing. So you didn't have the problem of animation being treated as a gen as a genre as much. We had uh, that problem because uh, when I was a kid, uh, adults didn't understand uh, how complex and different uh, Japanese animation was uh, uh, compared to American animation and even compared to Japanese animation itself. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, we kids had uh, the idea. Uh, we, we knew that there was more than they saw and and magazines and uh, so on uh, gave us the fuel to to talk about that. Mm -hmm. oh. 
which is which is certainly good is certainly good and that whole, and that whole sub, that whole subgenre knowledge issue is unfortunately still a problem I, I see today uh, where where you ha where you have folk who who um who lump who would lump sh who would lump shonen and Sa and seinen into the into the same ballpark yeah um i know that the, i know that there's I I know that there's a genre that's that's the female equivalent of seinen. I just can't recall the name of it, but mm -hmm. I but I know that it is a thing. Maybe not as much yeah. maybe not as much of a thing as it was thirty years ago, but it is a thing. Yeah, there are actually too many subgenres to to remember if you don't follow them and if you're not a fan. So I I wouldn't even cons I'm more of a researcher than than a than a fan at times. <laughs> but I do I one thing when I when I started I remember when I started studying um anime that that took on a life of their own in in countries out, outside of the US um there were there were some interesting results that I ended up finding um one one of the bigger ones is Space, is space adventure cobra being very big in France and for reasons I'm not I still I still haven't been able to find out um Saint Seiya being very big in Spain um, yeah uh, I I can answer to that if you are curious I, I um, am yeah so in the 80s um there was a um, a syndication in Europe that was Fininvest uh, that had uh, some TV channels in Spain and in Italy, and they bought a lot of uh, um, Japanese anime, um, especially for uh, young kids or young uh, boys. Mm -hmm. One of those was Senseiya, and they bought only the first 18 episodes, and they kept on... Uh, um broadcasting those first 18 episodes every month so one episode a day each day uh, that means you had to see the first 18 episodes twice in a month every month until they realized they had only 18 episodes and bought the other episodes so it became quite um uh a weird thing to not have seen Senseiya because there was, it, it was always on and it were always the the same episodes that you had to see and that's probably why, both in Spain and in Italy, Senseiya it's so so big. Yeah, and it's those kind those kind of things always always fascinate me and I've I've um I've touched I've touched on how it how it works both ways in the sense that the a lot of people a lot of people would think would would think that because of the ubiquitous ubiquitousness of dungeons and dragons in a lot of english speaking countries that the same would be the case in japan not so the the bigger na the big name is still sword world over there yeah um <laughs> and one of and one of the bigger names was, has been Call of Cthulhu. It has a lot of tentacles, but so <laughs> understandable. And, I'd be lying if I said that was the first time I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> no the the reason that the reason that I was t I was told is be is because a lot of a lot of the a lot of the A lot of the st a lot of the stylings of Call of Cthulhu appealed to the um, people who were writing replays for magazines at the time. Replays are kind of a written version of the of the of the actual plays that we have nowadays. Yeah, and because and be that's that was a contributing factor with um, Call of Cthulhu, with Call of Cthulhu. I'd imagine the other thing is that long form long form campaigns are not exact are not as much of a thing mm -hmm. because a lot of people will play 
we'll play get we'll play games rent at a um at like a at like a karaoke room that they've rented out. Yeah. So, the idea of of multi session long form campaigns isn't really a th isn't as much of a thing. You'll s I see a lot more prevalence of one shots. Mm hmm. So that that can play a factor. It's just interesting how the how these things can play out. Hmm. Um, yeah. But now with now um with sh with um with the conversion of of Knights of the Round into into emulating shonen anime in particular um was were there any, were there any were there any major obstacles conver converting from converting from one to the other well not actually because uh, shonen it's already a part of uh, kotra in, in the in its core um limit points go in that direction uh limit breaks go in that direction so there's a lot of shonen in kotra as it is I just had to um, find what lineages work best uh, um, and what jobs uh, could cover most of the action uh, you see in uh, in shonens. Mm -hmm. There are some uh, jobs I left out because I hope I can write a, a, a second expansion for Kotra. Uh, which would be Knights of the Round Ronin, and it's basically just a Japanese flavored uh, expansion. Mm -hmm. So the ninja is not in the new jobs in Shonen because I hope to put it there. But there are things like the athlete, the collector, the henshin, uh, the idol, the majako, and the esper. Mm -hmm. uh, as well, in in the lineages, the, the lineages are what uh, has been easier, easiest to to write because you can see them in every anime, basically the orphan, the vessel, the wandering soul. They are everywhere. Yeah. So it, it's been really actually, it's been really easy to to write shonen. Mm -hmm. Now. With the, with that in mind, I'd like to play a little bit of association first with the lineages and, the, and then with the jobs. Um, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to list them off from top to bottom, and I'd like I'd like you to go to go into what anime served as an inf served as an influence for them, and what and what might be um, what anime or characters from anime um, would would provide parallels for them. Yeah. Um. So of course, the first one is the orphan. The orphan, it's uh, from the father of all shonen, I would say. Uh, so Dragon Ball, but Naruto as well, and many others. Mm -hmm. And if if we look at the legacies, uh, there's the amnesia, and uh, Goku doesn't know anything about his childhood, uh, and he's been raised by someone else. Um, the bizarre appetite. Uh, works for uh, Goku, Naruto, and basically every shonen uh, protagonist ever. Mm -hmm. The Anomaly, uh, still uh, from Dragon Ball, he has a tail and no one else has a tail, so mm -hmm. you, you know there's something uh, there. Mm -hmm. And Mark My Destiny, it's still Naruto. Yeah, I know. Um, the, the, the mark uh, Naruto has on his uh, stomach to 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 seal the nine tail fox. It's basically this. I could also ask if Mark by Destiny was a JoJo reference. <laughs> yeah, everything is a JoJo reference, and there are many <laughs> others. But there are many others re JoJo references in the yeah in the manual. Yeah, but but the but the flavor text of a constellation shaped scar. That's Hokuto no Ken, if I ever heard it. Yes, that's Hokuto no Ken. Oh, uh, and tr truth be t truth be told, it's I remember going through the bizarre the bizarre appetite leg legacy, and one of my dear friends had sa had said, "Are you being called out because that's exactly how you eat?" Oh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the reason why they say that is the is the last time we were at a convention together, um, there was continental breakfast. 
and I knew I was going to be I knew I was going to be running around a lot, um, ca catching di catching different panels and getting as much as I could. So, I I ended up ha I ended up having two I ended up having two plates full 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 of stuff because you know it's, it's continental breakfast. Who the hell's going to stop me? <laughs> mm -hmm. And. And my bu my buddies look looking at me like you're gonna you are not gonna have room for lunch with all that. I'm like, yeah, fuck you, I'm not. <laughs> in my in my defense, I'm 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 six foot six. <laughs> you have a lot of space to to fill. <laughs> yes, or or just or just shy of two meters, if that if that helps. Yeah. So yeah, a lot a lot of space to fill, and since I'm gonna be move, and since I'm gonna be constantly on the move, that that uh, it that space is gonna get burned is gonna get burned through quick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> but um, next uh, next up on the list is the vessel. Yeah, the vessel uh, has. For legacies that all uh, have something to do with an entity that lives in the protagonist's body, mm -hmm. uh, but they are basically all Naruto, uh, <laughs> because you can lose control, and that's Naruto in the first arc of his uh, of his life, uh, where he l loses control and and the QB takes control. Uh, yielding control uh, it's when he learns to share his power with the uh, nine fox the uh, nine tail fox mm -hmm. manifest the power it's actually more from um sensei like um thing because you burn your core to the limit of the cosmos mm -hmm. While the unexpected friend, um, I don't think there's a single anime that comes to mind that has this. Uh, there's obviously a Zelda reference because, hey, listen, uh, it's that hideous fairy we all know. But um, there are a lot of uh, anime with the um, protagonist that can see a ghost or uh, the embodiment of uh, a, a lost. Uh, if you don't mind me referencing something Tokusatsu related, um, a recent example of Unexpected Friend would probably be um, Kamen Rider Revice. Yeah, that works as well. Um, it's it's basically every every anime um, where the protagonist has um, a connection with an entity that doesn't control his body, uh, cannot uh, enter the real world. Uh, but it's there and it's someone you can rely to that gives you advice. And uh, uh, even Mob Psycho 100 has this kind of unexpected friend. Uh, so that's another way to see the yeah. unexpected friend. If you don't mind me making a, de a deep cut to PS2 RPGs, um, Okage Shadow King also comes to mind. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Since well, the the titular Shadow King is is occupy is literally occupying the protagonist's um, shadow in that sense because yeah. that was the only way to get rid of, get get rid of a pig Latin curse. <laughs> Okage doesn't take itself seriously. But then the the next one on the list is Wandering Soul. Yeah, so the Wandering Soul, it's basically the Isekai type of uh, protagonist. That's the fish out of water. So every every Isekai that has someone that doesn't know anything about uh, where he ended up. Um, the obsession on the other uh, uh, on the other side, it's though it's from those Isekai that. Um, Basically, like a night and magic, uh, uh, the protagonist is someone who knows everything about what's going on. He studied the the, the game, 
the anime, the book, the everything uh, that might be related to mm-hmm. the world he ends up. Yep. Uh, and then there are the Immortal and the Red Thread of Destiny. Um, the Immortal is not uh, from a, a, an anime, actually. It's from South Park, because they killed Kenny. And uh, the Red Thread of Destiny, it's from an old uh, Japanese and Chinese tale um, about two souls that have to end up meeting uh, you can see that in uh, your name, uh, but there I'd are say, other. I'd say you can see that kind of thing a bit more, li- a bit more literally, or re- or rather a bit, a bit, a bit more upfront in Kill the Kill. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it doesn't help that the life fibers are red, <laughs> but. I ended up I ended up ruin I ended up ruining cla- a a a um classic for for some friends of mine when I when I said and this is hard to argue against technically speaking through the looking glass or Alice in Wonderland is an isekai. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, sure. Uh and, even the Divine Comedy by Dante it's an isekai. And while while I'm ruining classics, um John Carter also counts. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I I you I normally would I normally don't bring that up but <clears throat> because of how a lot of people grumble about isekai being um being oh, being over overdone or this inv- or this invading um genre that's suffocating everything else the concept of the name isekai might be new but the concept is not yeah, it literally means just another word. So, and if if we have to use something that ha- that is a little bit closer to to um, what to what Kotra has, um, Escaflone. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but uh, that's the one of the core uh, influences for the uh, core book uh, of Kotra. So, yeah, but the. Then there, then there is um, an un, in a, ineluctable, and I know I, I know I screwed up pronunciation of that. Ineluctable. In- um, yeah, it's basically uh, if you ever saw K the Metal Idol, um, most of these come from there. Uh, so the living weapon idea, it's uh, actually K the Metal Idol. Mm-hmm. Um, on the verge of, of extinction, um, it's all of those anime that uh, have one of the last kind uh, of something, uh, species or anything else. Mm-hmm. Uh, the rival is from Naruto, again, and many others, I'm sure, but uh, when I wrote it, I had uh, Naruto in mind because you choose a rival mm-hmm. and you gain affinity points uh, until you can uh, um, bring your rival back to life or you can convince them that they were wrong and that you were right and that's what naruto does in the end with uh, sasuke so Mm -hmm. that's the the influence main influence yeah and obviously obviously there's the the whole the whole thing with with um Fortunate, fortunately, thinks I don't think Core had to cha- had to change all that much. A lot of the, a lot of the, co- a lot of the core traits can st- can still can still be utilized in one form or another. Since the beauty of Hexus is, since it since everything is based on tags, yeah. you don't ha- you don't have to add too much crunch to everything. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's actually been really easy to mix and match uh, lineages and jobs from Kotra and Sean and uh, uh, we ran a few campaigns to test uh, everything out and um, yeah it's it, it's seamless because you just write a phrase somewhere and uh, the core the um, your core your line, line, lineage and your soul uh, work in every setting basically if you choose fire as uh, your core 
uh, you might, and you are playing Dragon Ball, you might not use that uh, often uh, your core, but you can still uh, fire a Kamehameha at someone and use your fire core. So, mm -hmm. oh. yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to jobs, obviously, I'd I'd like to continue the tr the tradition. Um, so, with a would it be fair of me to say that with athlete, this could, this could apply to to en to any and all um, sports anime? Yes, and uh, also to food wars, which I uh, try to make it a little clear because one of the sports you can choose it's cuisine and uh, your specialty should be discount food and that's uh, <laughs> what soma does in uh, food wars but yeah everything uh, sport related uh, um, falls under the athlete job uh, which might also be a martial artist so again we are back to uh, okuto no ken uh, dragon ball Everything uh, that has a martial component to it mm -hmm. can fall under this. Uh, I do have I do have to wonder if you'd if you'd also if say if say the fo the focus is on some is on some sort of board game like sh like um like Go a la Hikaru no Go if that would count under athlete as well. I think so. Yes. Um... The, the idea of what a sport is, it's pretty broad and so everything you can train for and uh, have a tournament of can be uh, something an athlete uh, does. Mm -hmm. And well, well, there's there's plenty of tournaments regarding re regarding things like Go and there's, plen and there's plenty of ways to do something similar to that in something like Shogi, even though... Um, It'd be it'd be difficult to do a shogi tournament because at because shogi involves having four people. Yeah, uh, I'm a big fan of Akagi, so that's why I, that's why I brought that one up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, it can be an athlete. Mm -hmm. So, and the. And I'm guess I'm guessing in, I'm guessing in that same in that same vein the if if the ro the role would um it in in say the martial arts aspect the role would be a fighting style but basically a specialization in that given sport. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you just want to uh, focus on the fighting. Uh, Maybe the athlete is not the ideal job. There are others than that can do that better. Um, this is uh, this is someone that enjoys what they do uh, as much as an athlete does. Um, mm -hmm. th that's the focus of the of the job. So training, training, uh, training, and become the best uh, of your specialized uh, area mm -hmm. uh, now when it comes to collector um, po I would yeah. bring up Pokemon but that's way way too obvious <laughs> yeah as well as Digimon um, one of the uh, of the influences uh, actually was Cardcaptor Sakura mm -hmm. uh, which falls uh, under the collector and the Majoko yeah. uh, as well. So I try to imagine uh, different uh, um, different anime, uh, how they might be mixed uh, uh, to to get what I wanted. And uh, Cardcaptor Sakura was actually one of the biggest influences on the collector after Pokemon. Mm -hmm. um, oh. I think... I think I referenced it somewhere in the in the book. Um, I can't remember where, but yeah. <laughs> um, I wonder. I wonder if. I wonder if the demon collecting that you see in the proper um, Megami Tensei games would also count under um, collector. 
Yes, that's actually how it has been played in one of the campaigns we used to test the the jobs. Although, uh, of of the available ones, the one the one that fe the one that feels like it would fit the most is um, Raido Kuzunoha. Mm -hmm. Not that's not to say uh, that's not to say the others the others wouldn't fit, but they'd fit, but the fit would be in different ways. Mm -hmm. I know it would be tempting to bring up Persona, but that would be a little bit too easy because more because more because um a lot of people are familiar with the concept of personas. Yeah, and actually, Persona, I tried to figure it out. It's uh, half collector, half esper, which is the next job. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, uh, the Esper, it's a job that focuses on your own mind and the power of your mind and uh, how you can use that to your uh, avail. Um, Persona was uh, an influence. Jojo was uh, the biggest influence, as well as uh, Hokuto no Ken. Mm -hmm as you have a uh, Nora perception which is basically in every shonen but you have the fighting spirit so your aura becomes visible and your body becomes uh, uh, full of power the air around you becomes heavy so that's actually <laughs> the what happens in Okuto no Ken when they when they fight uh, mm -hmm. at a certain level and you have the option to use your stand instead of your knight so this is great yeah oh. I, the other the other thing that instantly came to mind when it came to esper was the galarian's duology mhm mm oh. which which is a bit which is which it which is dealing with psionics induced by by um certain certain chemicals just with the risk of if you if you overuse it, you could short out. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then there was the one that I I remember, I remember you sending me a preview of of this while it was while it was being developed. The yeah, the henshin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is senseiya, basically, uh, and many others, uh, of course, uh, all the Kamen Rider and. Uh, Every other uh, Japanese superhero falls under uh, under the Henshin umbrella, but what I had in mind when I wrote uh, most of this, it's Senseiya because, as I said before, um, it was really huge here in Italy, and it has a great uh, impact on everyone uh, in their mid thirties, as I am. Uh, mm -hmm. So. And 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 to be and and to be fi to be fair, I can. Um, I do I do remember I do remember ta talking at one point with you about using it to adapt to adapt the the old the old writer project that I worked with some of my colleagues with um, years ago, yeah. as well as well as um, I've meant I mentioned that the two. The two, the two of the, the two of the of the big four in Tokusats, that would be the, that would be the easiest to adapt into tabletop role playing games are Ultraman and um, Garo. Largely because of the fact that they that their particular theming stays relatively consistent. Mm -hmm. Garo is is. Is um ho is fantasy horror leanings, and Ultraman has always leaned into science fiction since day one. Yeah, they would work as uh, as Henshin uh, mixed with uh, other jobs. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of options you can explore. Yep. Now, when it comes to the I when it comes to the idol job. I've got a few guesses, but I'd like to I'd like to see what the it what the primary inspiration was. 
Um, I'm not sure if you ever heard of Creamy Mummy. It's no. an 80s uh, uh, shoujo uh, majoko anime. Mm. It was really popular here in Italy, and uh, it still is, even though it hasn't been on TV for, I think, 20 years. Um, the idea was that there was this little girl that transformed into an idol uh, using a magic wand, and she was very popular. So that was the biggest uh, influence on the idol as well as other video games and animes uh idolish uh, of course um but i think creamy mommy was the most important one mm -hmm. and there's a little of um food wars in here as well because uh you might say that Cuisine, it's an art, and you might inspire someone uh, with your food the skills. So as as something that happens in Food Wars, it's also an influence here. I'll I'll have to I'll have to tell you about the symposium of life con concept that uh, that we had written on the podcast a while back. Because it it when you met when you mention art, it dips it dips right into that. <laughs> uh, and then there's Majoko, which um, I think I think this one is f this one you you already mentioned um, Card Captor Sakura being what being one of the frames of reference. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of, uh, of influences here. Uh, Card Captor, uh, Creamy Mami, as I was saying. Uh, turn into an idol with a magic wand and could do magic with uh, with it. Uh, Sailor Moon, it's mm -hmm. uh, Majoko slash the Henshin. So there are a lot of uh, things here as well. Um, in the uh, in the magic uh, section of the Majoko, I try to uh, bring out some of the influences in the examples. Um, there are tarots because uh, Card Captor Sakura was one of those, but there are magic crystals, uh, musical instruments. Uh, um, mm -hmm. If you if you want to look it, into that, there are a lot of uh, hints of what uh, Majoko is for me. And the whole, the whole the strength of the kingdom. Why am I get, why am I getting flashbacks to um, Noctis from? FF fifteen, yeah, because he's kind of a majoko. If you look at the at the core of the of the character, he has a a magical power that comes from his blood and uh, actually can transform uh, him, or at least make him do something others can't. Mm -hmm. And. And of course, there's the there's the whole thing with the um, with the, with the royal arms being being the arms of past generations of kings. Yeah. Plus, uh, in the in the end of uh, Final Fantasy fifteen, um, the power of the feelings uh, of Noctis and his uh, companions clearly take uh, the stage for a, a little while at least and that's part of the majoko fascination mm -hmm. uh, and now when it when it came to when it came to turn when it came to tournament arcs which you which you put which you put a specified spot in the book um yeah. Was was the tournament arc some, something that you wanted to put in from the get from the get go, or was it or was it something that Im that emerged midway through development? Uh, it actually was one of the stretch goals we wanted to do um, during the Kickstarter. We didn't uh, unlock the stretch goal, but as I was writing Shonen and I was talking with uh, Emanuele. Uh, who is the author of the playing a tournament arc uh, chapter? 
we were talking uh, about uh, about anime and uh, we we just decided to go with it anyway because tournament arcs are so part of the DNA of shonen anime that not having them would be a loss for everyone mm-hmm. both uh, bo- both the the, the clients uh, <laughs> those who bought Kotra and us as well mm-hmm. and we tried it out uh, in a in a podcast uh, it worked so we put it in the book yep and I, and I, I also saw that that you had put in a a um, side a side sheet to help to help track to help track these these things. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But I I could easily see this that some I could easily see the possibility of some folk having having the assumption that that ter- that tournaments have are going to be individual characters and not teams. They might. Uh, there are rules for uh, both of the tournaments, uh, both as a group and as an individual. Um, they work either way, but I prefer uh, group tournaments, um, especially given there are athletes in the in the mix. And uh, um, being a Kotra, a game based on uh, uh, the help of others and uh, not being alone, I hope people will play tournaments as a as a group as a team. And I, I can the thing that the thing that I find interesting is that you added an you added a you at you added in a re, the grit resource into um, tournaments. Yeah. Um, what pro, what prompted adding a brand new resource for uh, for tournaments? Well, basically, we wanted to um, have a way to decide who would win in a in a fight when the students weren't involved, and also we wanted to give the students a way to influence who uh, who won or who they ended up facing. So um, this great. Uh, um, has this uh, this purpose to allow the players to um, guide the tournament up to the point where they have to face their opponents. Mm-hmm. Now, with with that in, with that in mind, uh, what? Because ov- obviously, obviously, um, Shonen has gone through its fair share of playtesting. What were some of the takeaways that you had during during playtesting? What were some of the lessons that you felt you learned? Uh, well, first, there are not enough jobs uh, to cover everything uh, anime has ever done, of course. Mm-hmm. But um, I found I found out that people uh, playing Kotra enjoy both when they win and when they lose, and that's something great to me um, mm-hmm. because it means that everything you do in the game has a purpose, has a meaning, and uh, even when you ended up uh, um, losing a tournament arc or uh, um, losing to a villain because it was too too strong for you or or, or, or whatever, or maybe you didn't act as a group and you acted out uh, alone. Mm-hmm. There was still uh, a, a sense of having done something meaningful uh, during the game. And that's something uh, I will always treasure. And I will try to 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 bring it uh, in other games I'm writing. So uh, the idea that Whatever you are doing, you can still have a meaningful uh, uh, play session, even though you are actually losing. That's the the best thing I can take out from uh, Shonen. It was part of Kotra as well, but 
um, once you remove the the mecha and uh, you bring it down to um, to a more human uh, level, because in in shonen uh, you are actually just uh, some guy, some person. It really strikes a, a note to me. Mm -hmm. And with that, in, with that in mind, I I know you mentioned the Ro the Ronin thing, but what what are some of the things that you have that you have planned for the future of Kotra down the road? Well, first of all, we have to finish the Nightball uh, rules, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they will be a print and play game, so they will allow you to play Kotra even without uh, having to play a role-playing session if you don't have the time to do it. Mm -hmm. And then I I want to uh, write uh, Ronin. Um, I already know the lineages and the jobs I want to write. I have a list of six new lineages and uh, six jobs. So that will be a lot. And it will take uh, from another game I wrote in the past, which is Monogatari. Mm -hmm. um, a samurai-oriented uh, uh, game uh, mm, where you are sure you will die in the end. But the, the game is all about how you will die. And that... Uh, that game uh, has a lot of uh, things in common with uh, Kotra. Of course, I wrote those two, so mm -hmm. <laughs> they have that in common. But the um, the idea is that I wanted to um, distill the um, the six basic uh, figures you can find in uh, traditional Japanese uh, uh, tales mm -hmm. from the past. And I will try to translate those into uh, jobs for a shonen anime. So it will be fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how that develops. Cool. But thank you. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for once again braving the hell of time zones to come all the way up to my temple. And I thank you again for uh, the opportunity of talking about Shonen, which is dear to me. Yeah. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> thank you. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!